Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I'm so excited to be with an entrepreneur, uh, an author. He is the founder of Lululemon, and uh, his name is Chip Wilson. Chip, how are you doing today? Fantastic, Brett. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you. It's, uh, you've got a heck of a story, and I'm excited for our listeners to uh, hear that. But like on every show, I always ask Chip, is, uh, it's a big question, but what, what helped make you the man you are today? Because you are more than obviously the father of five boys, a husband, an entrepreneur, and an author. Uh, what helped you make all those things? <laughs> well, of course, everyone wonders how much is genetics and how much is environment. And I think I had the perfect amount of both. You know, as uh, athletic, you know, a father who was an athlete and a mom who was a home sewer. Um, and then I, and then I think we just never had much money. We kind of that lower kind of middle class dad was a, you don't make much money as a phys ed teacher. And, uh, but I think I had a lot of drive and I think that that, I sometimes wonder, is that genetic or is that, uh, was I, you know, was that built into me? I don't know, but I feel like I just wanted to succeed. I wanted to find out what was going on in the world. I wanted to, had all these ideas and I wondered if everyone else had the same idea. And so that, uh, that drive obviously uh, helped you very much in the, uh, in the, in the business, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about Lululemon in a little bit, but I know you, you got into what, sur you had a surf company, you had a skate company, a snowboarding company, all sorts of stuff. So tell us about those. Well, when I graduated at university, I was 25, so I was on the eight-year bachelor program. <laughs> I, never I, that. I started to do triathlons, and that was, I mean, that was a long time ago, so 19, probably 80, I guess. And th there was only about 10 people in the world doing triathlons. I had, um, I quickly found out that there was no good clothing, especially for that kind of distance, and a lot of rashing, a lot of issues and because my mom was a sewer and I had some ideas I started making triathlon clothing but mm. of course there wasn't enough people to make it. Um, I was originally from California, San Diego and living in Canada and um, and so I with that I started supplementing what I had and started bringing up surf gear from Gordon Smith and Stussy and OP, Billabong, Quicksilver and that into Canada. So really the first person to bring that into Canada, kind of a, a virgin territory for that market. And, um, and so I think that I just, uh, that the travel and stuff didn't go, but the surf stuff went really well. And then that kind of had its rise and fall because you start in almost every industry, you start off with three businesses it goes to 500 and then falls to three again. And so as that was going up and falling, then skateboarding was coming up and then falling and then snowboarding, you know, came up and then started falling too. So I, I followed those general trends. And so you followed those trends and then you saw another trend uh, around mindfulness and yoga and, and you started this, uh, this little company called uh, Lululemon. So talk to us about that. I'm, I'm wearing Lululemon pants right now too. Hope that's all right. I, I wear them all the time. Well, you never know what people are wearing behind the microphone. That's right. I'm sitting down. <laughs> That's right. I think, um, like I said, I saw these, you know, um, athletic social trends, you know, rise and fall. I had failed a couple of times. I tried beach volleyball and I tried mountain biking. But what I discovered is neither of those sports, um, which became big, no one wanted to look like that on the street. So, um, you know, I got, I got, I sold my surf skate snowboard company and I sat around for a while and I kind of looked around and of course I was injured from, from falling a lot, snowboarding and skateboarding. So I started doing yoga first class that was in Vancouver type of thing. And I looked around and I went, you know, this is going to, this is pretty cool. This is going to be, I could sense it went from six people to 30 people in one month. And, uh, and if I extrapolated back the surf skate snowboard business, I went, well, this is going to be just as big and mm -hmm. as much opportunity. So I had an expertise in technical apparel, especially first layer stretch for women that went under snowboard clothing. And I just started making it uh, a version of that for yoga. And, and, uh, and then I could go into a million different ways of, of going from there. But maybe you have another question you want to lead me well, to. Well, I just, I think it's, you know, it's one thing to have an idea. It's one thing to say, oh, you know, my mom, uh, you know, knew how to do this stuff. I know how to do that stuff. But I mean, how did you go out and then just create this Lululemon craze? And I know we could talk about that for hours, but 
it has become a brand that I think is, uh, you know, in the athletic wear, obviously, but it's also a, a symbol. Uh, you know, the, the kids want it. Uh, you know, moms want it. Dads want it. Now, heck, my some of my boys, you know, want to wear the T-shirts and stuff. I mean, you've created this thing that's it's become a brand, a symbol, right? And so how did that happen? Because it doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah, so you're looking for the aha moment and then what to do with it type of thing. Is yeah. Sense. Um, when, um, so I was in the middle of this yoga class and I was only like 15 days into it and I read an article in the newspaper where it said 60% of the graduates at a university were now women. And in 1998, that was a phenomenal number because when I went to university, it felt like 20%. Sure. You know, maybe because I couldn't get any dates, it felt like 20%. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. But, um, it, it really, I mean, that was astounding to me. And I'd done work and a lot of reading in Africa about the whole goal was to educate women because the, the more educated women are than the fewer children they will have and the longer they'll wait to have children. So I extrapolated out and I went, oh my God, you know, for the first time ever, we're going to end up with a brand new employee and a brand new consumer that's, consumer that's never existed before. A highly educated university woman that now goes into the workforce and now suddenly isn't leaving at the age of 24 to have a family. And so they're going to wait till they're 32. So that's, that's what I extrapolated. So with that market then became the new Lululemon employee and it became a customer that was uh, highly educated, media savvy, owned their own condo, traveled with as was athletic, stylish, basically a lot of consumer spending involved. Um, and so I went, so that was there. And then also I could sense that in the nineties, there was a, there was a lot of, talk in the media about breast cancer for women. And I and I had sensed from being in the workforce and kind of and being the age I am that uh, prior to that, you know, women who came into the workforce were kind of emulating their fathers. And yeah. they were doing the three martini lunches, they were smoking cigarettes because they thought that that's what was successful. And I think, you know, when you combine that with the heavy dose of the pill at that time, I think it created, you know, the, the atmosphere for breast cancer at that time. So I think when, when, these, um, when these girls that were 20, now going to be 22 to 32, which I call, who I call super girls, um, had these power women, uh, mothers, who were basically unhealthy. And these super girls just didn't want to live their life like that. And I think that yoga was something that was accessible, it was feminine. And when I mean accessible, they could do it lunch hour, they could do it in the morning. You didn't have to go to snow, you know, find the surf, you didn't have to find the mountains. And, um, and it was, yeah, so it was feminine, stylish, the whole works. And I think um, when you combine that with, I had a couple other ideas, do you want to hear them? They're, sure, sure. Well, I call this, I call the Supergirl Supergirls because that, in the in the nineties, uh, for the first time, you saw a girl in uh, with superheroes like cartoons, and so they they were wearing lycra and they were equal in power to men, and I think that the Supergirl mothers were wearing all the big power suits with the big shoulder pads, looking very mannish, but who the girls were looking up to were these like lycra clad power superheroes on TV. So I also think that. Um, in the 90s, or uh, you had amazing, the probably divorces peaked. And I think you had um, uh, fathers who didn't never knew what to do with, a, with their daughters. Right. And they became baseball coaches, soccer coaches, and athletic coaches. And so I think these girls became exceedingly athletic. And, um, and I think that the, um, you know, basically they, those, all those things kind of combined together provided the, the perfect template for this new market and this new sport. So do you, let me, I, I'm, I pause there for a second. I'm just thinking in my mind about, it, it seems like you are a very deep thinker, right? I mean, you keep thinking, I think this, I think that, I mean, you're tying the kind of the comic Wonder Woman type person to the business woman today. And, and you bring that together into this brand, right? So when, when you think, when you say, I think, are you a thinker? Are you sitting around in a room thinking all day? What are you doing? I'm, I'm probably a reader. Okay. I'm 
phenomenal amount and always have. I, and I, I, where'd that come from? I don't know, but it's, um, you know, I would, I'd read every magazine, three or four newspapers a day. Um, uh, I very rarely watched TV when I was young. Um, and even to today, except for Netflix is kind of taking. <laughs> um, and I think that I just was always extrapolating. I was extrapolating out ideas and I was um, meshing two uh, different ideas together. And basically when I could see three things happen very, very quickly, I would jump on it, which is kind of what I did in surf, skate, snowboard, and then again in yoga. So I would have seen a, a, um, the first yoga class I would have had would have had a little poster on a telephone post with a little rip off telephone, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And then maybe a couple of days later, I would have heard two women talk in the coffee shop about yoga. And then I would have read an article about yoga in the newspaper or something, you know, that and I'd go, Oh my God, like I've, I've never, never like seen anything about yoga. And now three things in one week, like, that's when an entrepreneur or someone who has an idea jumps on it. And then once, once that three things happen, I mean, I can, my mind immediately goes out 20 years hmm. and goes now, is this something that I should do or not do? And um, at that time in my life, I could definitely have um, I've done nothing. I had sold my, my first company. And when I mean nothing, that means I'd have to get a job as a barista at Starbucks to, <laughs> you know, but I could have, paid off a house and bought a car and sent my kids to, to school. So, um, but you know, it was, I decided to jump back in the okay. idea was too good. Yeah. So talk about the, the success of Lululemon, but on the flip side of that, we're going to, I would like to talk about what's, what's some of the stuff that maybe brought you to your knees or some of your failures that you publicly shared that, um, you know, so many of us, I think we look at people like you and we say, Oh gosh, here's this guy that, had this, you know, meteoric rise to success, but clearly it wasn't that. And, and so what are some of those failures that as a newer Lululemon founder that you were bumping into uh, that, that were really tough? Well, yeah, even before I say that, I think to say 20 years, I had this company called the West Beach Surf Company and, and it didn't make any money. So it was every year I thought it would do better. Every year I thought it would do better every year. And um, at the end of the day, I had these two, um, uh, two retail stores of our own. We made our own clothing, designed it, put it in our stores. And these two stores made a million dollars a year. And these two, and these made this international wholesale business we had lost a million dollars a year. So what I'm really getting at there is that there was like 20 years of learning. And then to be able to sell that and sit back and go, okay, what didn't work about that and what did work about it? So what did work about it is the vertical retailer, get, getting rid of the wholesaler. Now, almost everybody gets into wholesale because you can make a few samples, show it to a lot of people, get a lot of orders, and then go to a manufacturer and get it done. But then you have to, then there's a big, big middleman in between that's taking a lot of the profit. So I'm, I'm getting around to your question. Oh, no, this is great. But it's, it's, it was a matter of, I had to get to five stores in order to get economy of scale production in order to get my costs down on my product to make any product. And when you come out with a brand new brand and a net brand new product with no marketing dollars, zero, I had none, then, then that's a struggle. And that's what every, almost every entrepreneur that goes into anything that needs mass production uh, goes through. So I borrowed, I bought a house, had bought a house for about half a million dollars in 1998. I borrowed 200 million, 200,000 on it, got through about a year, borrowed another $200,000 on it. And, um, and then, and then that's it. Right. And then I ran out of that. And then I had done some wholesale cause I had to do wholesale in order to get my economy of scale numbers up. That company went bankrupt. And so now I didn't have enough money to pay my employees. And uh, so I got a job, um, West Beach moved back from Portland back to Vancouver and they offered me a job to be CEO. So I took that job in order to fund Lululemon. And then we ran out of that money. And then I, if I hadn't, and then that Christmas, if I hadn't got fired from West Beach, because they, com they really combined Sim skateboards and West Beach, or West Beach uh, snowboard together. And so that CEO took over. So I got a $50,000 severance 
If it wasn't for that 50 little, little breathing room, yeah, <laughs> it never would have happened. Yeah. So there was a bunch of things in there that, uh, and actually another thing that happened is that the Vancouver housing prices were going up so fast that I was able actually to take another hundred thousand, you know, at that point. Right. So there I was, I was mortgaged to the hilt and had everything in this business and it was either going to work or I was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, or and homeless, right? Uh, yeah. So, but talk about that because there's a lot of learning even just in that. Is a lot of people are, are listening to this, right? They may be driving on the road, they may be in their job, and they're not happy. They've got this great idea, this vision that's 20 years long, but a lot of people are scared to go take three loans off their house, right, and go into debt, and as you would say, push all the chips in, right? A lot of people are scared to do that. So, what was it about you that was different? Do you think? Well, I think for me, because I'd seen it three times before in the surfskate snowboard business, I, I had an idea of where it was going. I also had F evidence of this new business, this new business model of being vertical and not wholesale. I could also sense that whoever got into a Lou Lemon product, you could see in their eyes, you could see how they feel. They, when they bought the, the clothing, they just didn't buy one thing. They were buying three things. And it, it, it wasn't, um, it was just like I had to have faith because I knew I had the right product at the right time for the right market. And, uh, and then I had to let I, myself, I wanted to let word of mouth make it work. And um, so anyway, but you're getting back to the people that are sitting on the freeway listening to it. I think there's two things for me. And that is if I was sitting on my deathbed and I didn't do it, would I always be regretting it? I only yeah. have one life to live and is it a life worth living? And I think the other thing on the other side I look at, which is quite recent, would my 12 year old self be proud of me today? And, and that really is an interesting thought because it goes, you know, like did I, did I, did I play a life of fear or did I live a life of possibility? Just writing that down with my 12 year old self be proud of me today. That's, that's phenomenal. And, and I think too, it's, it has become this like luxury brand, right? It, it's right. whether you have your iPhone and a Lululemon pants and your, you know, Louis Vuitton purse, right. For the women you know, in the world. And, and, and it's, but how does that happen to when at the time, I guess there really wasn't a lot of competition, but you're still able now to go out and sell a $120 pair of pants in that world right? A pair of yoga pants when everybody else wants to charge 50 bucks. I mean, how do you get away with that? Well, because um, people are under the perception that it's the same product. Yeah, and it's not. At the end of the day, um, the idea was to make a better quality product at a better price than the competition. The fact is, is the competition can't make a better product than Lululemon. And the reason is, is because Lululemon is vertical doesn't have to doesn't have any wholesale so it can make because it it only sells to itself it doesn't have to have the same um, um, markups so what am I saying there um, so what what ends up because Lulem can make a better quality product at a better price its goods are made out of nylon not polyester so polyester stinks and polyester doesn't feel the same way that nylon does it doesn't it doesn't combine with the lycra or, um, or, the, um, or the technical uh, properties that we can put inside fibers can go inside nylon so much better than polyester. So the, you know, the anti-stain, anti-wicking, um, the, the breathability, it's just an entirely different product. But you can't really, Blue Lemon is, was set up never to kind of like be a rah-rah about itself. You know, so it doesn't have to be. We put all our money into training and development of people and the quality of the product, and we let people talk for the, for it for the product. So while you're talking about that, I know personal development <clears throat> was a big deal for you personally, but also it was a really big deal for your employees. So talk about that and what role that played in the company. Well, I was selfish in that I when I started Lululemon, I just decided I never wanted to be with anybody I didn't who wasn't phenomenal and great, and I wanted to go to work with every day. That's where I spent all my time. So, so from that point of view, I just want people to know that it was a selfish thing. But <laughs> and uh, but I also knew that 
that suddenly you had all these women that were out of the university and no, and I think I was the only person that could really see that they were going to be around for at least eight years, nine years before they had, before they had a family. So they were really worth investing in. And I got to get no other company was investing in women at that time. It just, there was just no return on it. Hmm. So, so to be, so I think the women that came to Lululemon, like, they were ready for it. They wanted something. And because um, personal development at that time was very unmasculine, but very feminine. I think this is the other thing that made Lou Lemon work in that women were really willing to take on like, who am I and how am I, how am I the most effective? How do I communicate? Um, when, you know, what is responsibility? What is integrity? You know, these things that I think men were masking, but women were really willing to face up to. So our whole program then was set up around those concepts, integrity, responsibility, and uh, which everyone's, everyone says that, right? But sure. here's, here's the thing about integrity. And everyone says they have integrity, but inside a company, if everyone has a different definition of integrity, then in fact, there is no integrity. Hmm. So the company has to have one definition of integrity, which then is then everyone knows what it is. So out of there are the four um, platforms that we used. And I would suggest this for any entrepreneur. It doesn't have to be the ones that I set out. But we, so the ones we used were Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the book Good to Great, which I think is yeah. the business book ever, um, The Psychology of Achievement by Brian Tracy, and inside of that is an hour of the psychology of why people do and do not goal set. And then the landmark form course, which really sets at what is responsibility, what is integrity, and how do people, what's the psychology about how and why people communicate. So you did that. So you had them read those, uh, those four books or go through those programs. And right. then what was, what, what's the, the accountability to that? So, yeah, yeah, I read it. Or is it, no, now there's a, a, you know, an hour meeting to talk about the book. What was that like? Yeah. Um, so one, two things. One, we set up a linguistic abstraction. So we had about 30 terms and definitions that, that came out of these books that we use as our platform for communication. Hmm. Um, the other thing we did is that, and I'll, this, is, this is actually the fascinating part. Um, so we were so big on goal setting. So in a goal then, a goal is only it differentiates from a vision because a goal has, is quantifiable with a buy-win date. So I'm going to take something pretty simple. So I'm sitting there, I'm 242 pounds, and I go, okay, um, by next December 31st, 2020, I am 230 pounds. Okay, that's a goal. Quantifiable with a buy win date. It could be things like, I will take my family to Croatia for seven days sometime next, you know, in the year 220, something like that. Yeah. We had them split between health, business, and, um, and personal. Now, the interesting thing about, that I've discovered about goal setting, and it really came from the landmark about creating um, our present from the future, not from the past. So I found that even I was setting my goals based on the past. So I'm 242 pounds, and I want to be 230 based on being 242 pounds. But if I was to wake up in the hospital with amnesia and I had no idea what, how much I weighed or, or anything, and I had no past history at all, and I went and researched what a six foot three, 64 year old man uh, should weigh, you know, it would say 208 pounds. So you can see the difference in goal setting between setting goals from an unknown future as opposed to a, a constrained past. And the difference would have been, what, 12 pounds. And that would have, would have been a massive difference. But, and I only use that because it's easy numbers to use. But when people think about you know, their career, how much money they want to make, or how, how much time they want to put into loving their, their, their spouse, or how much time they want to spend with their children, these, those, that 12 pounds is 10%, which is what makes things work or don't work in life. Yeah, that's the game changer, isn't it? So how did you drive that in your culture? I mean, what you personally, I know, obviously, is the, the founder, the CEO, the leader, the everything of that company early on. How did you personally drive culture? Well, 
I, th I actually, once I set it, the template up, as I said about so many things at Lululemon, I think I, I set a template up and then we just had these amazing people that just took it and ran with it. I'm kind of an idea guy. I'm not a structural person. And, um, but I think that there was something in these goals that had people's lives really work for them. And of course, Lou Lemon, not only because of the product and the business model, but because of the type of people we have, it ended up making so much money. It was almost a self, um, what do they call that? A self uh, prophecy. Self prophecy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's going to happen. Um, but well, I had a template for goal setting um, in 18 goals. So you set a goals for, first off, you set a vision for your life, like 10 years out. So mine would have been, well, mine was like 20 or 30 years out. It was, I'm going to be sitting around a table at Thanksgiving with my children and grandchildren, and I'm going to, they're all going to be laughing at me because I'm old and crazy, you know? I mean, if that happens that, you know, at that, at 85 or something, then I'm going to be a happy man, right? Yep. So then I start working my goals back from there. So what are the 10 year goals I have to have? What are the five year goals and what are the one year goals? And when you start at the top of the vision, you work back that it makes it pretty easy to do one year goals, seeing where you have to get in the five and 10. Yep. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And I think, and, and I'll just give you my concept of, of, and give me your feedback on this. But one of them is I call it focus 90. So when I walk in my office door every day, I set my briefcase down, I get my water. I know the things I got to do. I got four things I got to do the first 90 minutes of every day. And if I can win that moment, I'll win the rest of the day. Right. And then, right. but my 10 year goal, my five year goal, my one year goal, and my 90 day goals are all written on that same piece of paper. And I read it every morning. Good for you. Well, that's probably why you are what you are. Yeah, but your, I mean, your thoughts on that, right? I mean, that's probably your habits and your rituals when you were early on in your career. Those were the things you were doing, right? So if you can, if you can give us a, a thought of a goal, I know you said at one point you wanted to open five Lululemons, but what's an example? Because you don't probably say, I want to sell one million pair of pants or I want to make $10 million. I mean, what were those goals at that time? Well, before I say Lululemon, there's just when I was a competitive swimmer when I was young. So I think so they had age groups, 10 and under, 11 and 12, 13, 14. So you knew that by the age of 14, that was the Canadian record, so to speak, or the American record, whatever you want to call it. And, and when you turned 15, you had to break, break the record by that day or you didn't. So it was automatic goal setting. I, you know, I will swim the 100 backstroke in X time by the age of my 15th birthday. So that type of thing. So... For us, for me, I remember my wife and I originally uh, setting out our goals. We had no money. We were in debt up to our eyeballs. And, uh, but, you know, we were the template for the, everyone else in the, in the company. My wife was the first designer, and so we were in it together. And um, so we decided we were going to have, uh, in 10 years, we were going to have $30 million in the bank. We were going to have a, a $10 million house on the ocean, and we were going to have and then what was it beyond that? Those were the material mm -hmm. ones, which are really easy for me to remember because sure. it happened. Now, what's interesting about that is because we had that set in, at a certain point when Lou Lemon became incredibly um, um, uh, strong and we were, our cash flow was unbelievable, um, we, we, did, we decided that we were going to prioritize family and we were going to prioritize the goals that we'd set. So then we just, that decision then had to sell to private equity. We didn't have to sell to private equity. We didn't have to end up going public. But we as a family had these goals and that, those goals are then driving our decision making. Yep. Makes total sense, right? The, the personal vision, the personal goals are driven by the vehicle that you happen to be sitting in, right? And that's uh, for you, that was Lululemon. So what changed for you when you were in debt up to your eyeballs, as you said, and now became massively successful financially? What changed? I don't, well, I don't think anything changed. I, yeah, by selling, of course, I lost control of Lululemon. And that's, sure. you know, that's another story. Um, because I started Lululemon quite late in life, I mean, Sometimes I get labeled with Colonel Sanders about starting businesses late. <laughs> you know, I was, I guess I was about 42 when I started, but Lou Lemon really didn't, you know, come to any success till I was 50. And, you know, those, 
eight years were, like I said, a struggle to get there. But it was, um, so once you're 50, it, it, I don't think anyone changes. You know, like it's the things that were always important to me was, you know, of course, health. And because without health, you know, that your ability to enjoy your family is, is very small. Right. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it comes down to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, you know, you, first off, you got to take care of survival and, uh, and reproduction. And once that's occurred, then you start moving into longevity and relation, you know, like healthy relationships. And I think that's where my, my priorities always lead. Well, I think it's, it's neat to hear you say that too, because people, I'm in the money business. It's what we do every day. And, and so people think once they reach these certain levels, right? Whether it's 10 million or a hundred million or a billion or 10 billion, that that's going to be the trigger point for something in their life. And, and all the successful people I get to talk to with people like yourself, there wasn't this moment of I have X in the bank and now my life is completely different, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what money does allow someone to buy is time. And as I'm 64, I, I mean, you can get where, where, like I have a driver, you know, and I have a driver and people go, oh my God, that's so ostentatious. But it's not any different than having an executive assistant or having a gardener at your right. house. You know, if, they, if I can pay that person $25 an hour and I can do $300 worth of work at the time he drives me to my workout and back, then I make money on that. Wow. So, it, it, I, I, and my whole idea behind driving, saving time is so I can be with my children and family because yeah. that's my highest priority. So what's that dude or, uh, or, or female, what, what are they doing right now? As we, we're speaking here today, where's the driver? Sitting outside waiting or are they at home waiting for the end of the day? <laughs> no, because often I'll walk home or things like that. So okay. I, you know, especially in the summertime. So no, they'll be, uh, they take care of, we have a couple of houses and they'll be taking care of some uh, renovations that we have going on. Nice. You know, if the guy, car needs filled with gas, I'll do that. Or I need to, you know, all those, all those things that you, you always wished you had someone to do, but doesn't do them. I got that. Person. You got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you a fist bump right there. That, that's awesome. So what are your habits when you were on the grind versus today? I think we'll talk about both of them if we can, but what were the habits and rituals that the no miss items that you had to do during the grind during the grind of, of building a business building a business I mean it's you know again we talked earlier before we started recording you know you have five sons I've got four sons and I'm you know I'm, I'm at work and then I go straight to a sporting event and it's coaching and then it's you know you go home and you go to bed and you get up and you do it all over again right it's this vicious cycle um, yeah. but what were those no miss items for you well I it's funny you say the grind because in Vancouver we have three mountains inside the city if you don't know right right on yeah. the ocean so it's a phenomenal place and and I do this thing called the grouse grind every morning oh. well, four mornings a week so it's a one hour hike straight up a mountain so it, it uh, so when you said that I was a little bit confused <laughs> <laughs> so in my must things I must do uh, first thing in the morning is I must get that endorphin rush and so I will go to University of BC, which is maybe about 10 minute drive away and run the stairs, um, which takes about maybe five minutes to get to the top of the stairs and the walk down. I'll do that five times. Wow. Or I'll do the grouse grind, which then takes an hour to do. It's just across the town. And, um, and then maybe, you know, so that's critical for me. Um, and then, um, and then what do I do coming into work? Um, now, as a, oh no, during the grind part of Lou Lemon, what would have occurred? I, th I think it's my, one of the things I made sure once a week I would sit down for an hour with just a pencil and a piece of paper and just think about where the, where the future needed to be. I think my expertise is actually seeing the world five to seven years in the future, which is really, really difficult for a lot of people I work with. Yeah. Because I'm kind of like, you know, I'm willing to give up a lot of what's happening and good right now in order to build out where the world is going. So that's important. And then I think it's just the regularly scheduled meetings and then probably even leaving at one o'clock and going for a walk or going for like a 30 minute run would have been critical at that time. And then, um, and then absolutely being home for dinner with my family was critical. Um, I, I, Again, part of selling the company to private equity was either I had to make the choice of I was going to be traveling, I building a global business. So we were already in many countries already. Either 
I was going to be on the road building a business or I was going to be letting that business let me raise a great family. And I, like so I chose the family. Well, that's a, that's a great choice. Great yeah. choice. It's, it's neat to see somebody at your level and, and that was still the number one priority. So congratulations on that. So what would you look back and tell the uh, Chip Wilson, the 30 year old Chip Wilson or the 40 year old Chip Wilson? What, what advice would you give that guy? I would have given that guy the advice that I probably, I didn't need to sell to private equity. I didn't need to go public. That's funny. I was listening to, um, to Bill Gates say exactly the same thing a mm. couple of months ago and uh, his big regret. Um, just the ability to move quicker and faster. And I think um, entrepreneurs can see the future and the, uh, it's very, very difficult for other people to see, especially inside a public company. I could have, with the massive amount that Lou Lemon was making at the time I did private equity, I, I probably could have just gone to my bank and said, give me $40 million unencumbered. And then I would have been able to buy my $10 million house and put $30 million in the bank and, uh, and then run the business that way. Yeah. But I didn't, and um, I, got a, I got a different outcome from it. So that would have been my, my I would say, I, I went private equity and in order to get advisors, because people had told me, well, I haven't, I haven't run a billion dollar company before, you don't know what you're doing, you need people around you. Um, the advisors I got through private equity, I think were, they were self-interested. They, and so I had, of course, as they should be, right? They're, I mean, I'm not, I'm not naive in that, but um, uh, what I mean is how I would have structured the deal going into private equity was uh, really handcuffed me is when we went public. I lost control of the board. I, so consequently, I lost control of the culture at Lou yeah. Lemon. And, um, <clears throat> and Lou Lemon went probably through five years of the greatest growth in athletic uh, clothing between Tally 2 to 13 and to 18 when it when it just went flat if you look at the stock it went nowhere because it kind of self imploded because it just had a it just had board of directors that you know were your normal run of the mill trying to do good people but you know who were running by fear as opposed to possibility yeah so talk to us about that i ask this in every episode fear uh, you mentioned it, so we'll bring it up now. But how many of the fears you put in your mind over your career blew up to the magnitude you put them in your mind to be? Do I have them? The fears. So you probably put some in your mind early on, right? Like maybe this won't make it. Maybe I'll go bankrupt. Whatever the uh, the fears were in your mind, how many of those actually blew up though? Well, I don't think, I can't say they actually did. I don't think I had that many. I don't think I had fears like that. I think part of my, what works for me in life is I'm incredibly trusting and I believe in people, what they say to me. And I, um, and I'm incredibly positive about the future. So I think that masks a lot of what, what other people have as fears. Now, where that works, that works for me because I get incredible people around me. We can build a great company, but then I also attract a certain number of people that are, let's say, unable to make money on their own, but they're entrepreneurial and knowing how to make money off of people who, who have my personality. And, um, and I have to sit back and go, well, I was always that way. You know, I drove an old car and left the keys in it because you want to take my car, go for it. I just right. don't. You know, because details and small things in life are very, very, they, they just can't take up my mind because I've got like big, big ideas. So I need to, uh, I need to free my mind to, um, to love and trust everybody, to think of possibility and be out there in the future, not get consumed with fear and what ifs. I love that. So and you don't have to name drop unless you want to, which is totally fine. But I mean, so when somebody gets to your level now, I mean, who are you surrounding yourself with to, to keep yourself a student in the game and, and, you know, grabbing lunch with, I mean, who, what, what is that buddy system like for you now today with your level? You know, interestingly enough, having been in Canada and being and on the West coast of Canada, I mean, yeah. there's nobody here. Like, yeah. you know, there's very, I have a, you know, a, a 90-year-old billionaire here in Vancouver, Joe Siegel, who um, 
was in the apparel business and is a wonderful, wonderful man. And I think about, um, you know, five years ago, he said to me, you know, Chip, you know, like you've got two more big ones in you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I went, well, that's interesting. And, you know, he said to me, you know, at 60, I kind of like, you know, it's not like I retired, but I started putting my money into real estate. I was making my 7% return a year. And here I am 90 years old and I've, you know, yeah, what have I done in 30 years? I've done nothing. You know, it wasn't exciting. He said, right. you know, like take 50% of all your own and risk it all. Wow. You know, what's it, what, I mean, what's it going to matter? Like do things that are, you know, outstanding. And then he also applied that to philanthropy, like rather than kind of spray and pay and doing a little bit here and there, you know, like what's really going to change the dial in the world, which I can do with the amount of money I have. Yeah. So are that those are, that's probably one really key person. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so you said smartphone, uh, it's killed the balanced life. Now there's only life choices. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. true. Talk to us about that. Well, it was, because I'm older, I got the context of observing my employees and observing people. And of course I have, you know, five boys, so I get to observe them too. I could, and even myself, and I could see where um, with the digital world, probably starting in 95 or something like that, the amount of time that the amount of information that was coming to each and individual person was becoming exponential. And I could also see that, you know, the algorithms that, you know, Google or Facebook, whoever has to keep them on, keep you on, their site and use them as much as possible was, was eating up people's, um, it was entertaining people in a way that gave them an endorphin rush. Um, what, I, what I saw then is that life was passing people by, as often happens, uh, without realizing that, oh, like 10 years has gone by and I, do I, have I really appreciated my life? Have I appreciated what I've done, where I've gone to, the people around me? Um, so, um, and then at a certain point, it became so easy to have a smartphone that you didn't need to be, you know, where you, when you're, you know, when you're at the office, you're at the office or your family with your family, but now you could choose to be anywhere, anytime. Right. Basically what I'm getting at is that we, because life was moving exponentially, the number of times a person has to stop and be present to the world and be present to the people around them and what's happening and to actually appreciate the life they have in that very exact moment has to happen not once every four months, but I actually expect today it needs to happen like four or five times a day. Wow. Because that phone can absorb everything and pretty soon as what happens to many people, they lay on their deathbed and they go, what the hell happened to my life? Yeah. What happened in that moment? Did I, why didn't I appreciate it when I was there? And I think that that's a life worth living. Well, we both have 13 year olds, you know, and you think of their life at 13 versus your and I's life at 13, completely different, right? It, it's, it creates this addiction. Yeah. And and it also, I'm, I'm fascinated by how much the brain can absolutely, absolutely absorb. And, you know, we all told, we were told when we were young, our brain, we're only using it to four or 5% of what's possible. And right. now learning how much, how much information can be stored in there. Lots of smart, capacity. You're smart. People. <laughs> so if I stole your phone from you right now, besides email, and I said, I'm going to delete an app, any, any, any phone, anything on your phone that just Chip Wilson could not live without speaking of technology? <laughs> I think it's this new app called Word Power. It's uh, Word kind of power. it's it's a um, uh, it's a crossword, and it's uh, works on a, it only gives you seven letters, and it's a crossword puzzle, and you've got to fill it all out. And I find myself totally addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> You're so gonna put your phone down, right? <laughs> and, uh, well, it's been interesting because I actually when I was, I was in Spain this last week, and I. And I, you know, it was a heat wave. Like it was, what was 123 degrees? And I'm oh, like man. 25K a day. I run across this cold, fresh pond and I, and I dive in. And of course, I've got my ear pods on and I've got my phone here and everything falls into the, into the pond. And so I've been without a phone for three days now. So uh -oh. take your point very seriously. Yeah, exactly. So what uh, favorite book you can recommend for our listeners? 
Um, Besides your own. <laughs> Legacy. Legacy. By Kerr, K-E-R-R. And it's about um, the most winning uh, sports team in history. It's New Zealand All Blacks. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that book. And, uh, and I read it. And I went, oh, my God. This is a story about the culture of Lululemon to top to bottom. There's absolutely no difference. Everything that they quote in there about how they learned and, and how they directed the people was all around good to great, the, the landmark form, uh, uh, seven habits, highly effective people, yep. and goal setting. So it was like, oh, it was, it was kind of neat to see that the number one winningest team in the world, you know, use the same platform. Right. Yeah, that book's a, uh, it's going to be around for generation after generation, isn't it? The seven habits of highly effective people. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's not the love? Right. Yeah. So uh, your favorite trip, uh, you've been around the world, obviously, probably multiple times. So uh, if you could go anywhere again today, where are you going? Uh, we're going to the Anti-Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And we're uh, hiking for seven or eight days, we call it glamour camping, you know, where we have, you know, lots of Sherpas and cooks yeah. and everything else. And they set the tents up and tear them down. But the terrain there uh, and the uh, moving from desert to the upper mountains, to the foothills, to you know, canyons was, uh, I did it before and that's the only thing our family wants to do again. And so your all your kids are going everything on this trip, huh? It's, it's the best, I think hiking now could be the last way that parents can, can have their kids like put their phones away because there's no service. And right. it's amazing, especially with boys, you know, after two hours of silence, they start talking. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Start talking and start fighting, right? Uh, so where can our listeners find more of Chip Wilson? Well, I guess they can find um, just going to chip, chipwilson.com. I have there and you can kind of move every, find everything from there. Yeah. And, um, definitely. I think it's, you know, probably reading my book and thanks for, for plugging it a bit. Absolutely. It's a great business book for entrepreneurs. And so you're sitting in an office there, it looks like. What's, uh, what's Chip Wilson's day look like today? Um, what did I, let's see, what did I do today? I got up, I took my boy to summer school. I came back, I'm without my phone. So I had to, uh, I, I walked here, so it was an hour and a half to walk to work along the ocean front of Vancouver, which is stunning. And I come through Gastown, which is our old part of this, the town where I am. And, um, and then I got into, oh, I had a call with a guy that did an article on, on me uh, from London a few months ago about the Blue Lemon AGM. And, uh, and then I was, and then I, of course, I hadn't been here for two weeks. So there's all sorts of packages with apparel um, samples and getting those to the right people. And um, um, yeah, and since someone wrote a book about, uh, I'll just show you, it's kind of, I just thought it's, Actually, I don't even know. It's called B, B Magazine. I haven't even unwrapped it, but it's uh, it was huh. about the, it's about uh, a third party that does that and synopsis is on brands and they, and I think that's one of the greatest things that we did at Lululemon is I put all the a lot of my sayings on the outside of the yeah. bag, and um, but you know Lululemon doesn't shoot. They only put like two or three on now. They don't put the fifty on I had before because it's a lot know, cooler then. We, yeah, we have a, we live in a world where you can't actually say, say truth anymore. You might hurt somebody's feelings, Chip. Oh, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> it's yeah. terrible. And I'm you even got them in the socks. You got them on the band of the T-shirts. They were everywhere. Yeah, it's so. true. Well, Chip, it's been awesome having you, man. And uh, it's, it's crazy what you have done. Uh, you've literally changed the way people uh, dress. I mean, have you ever really thought about that? Yeah, I have. You know, and it's... Of course, I dressed that way for so long. Sure. You know, like even back in the day of going to, to work in a suit and tie, I had my skateboard shoes on because I skateboarded to work. And <laughs> people now kind of thinking that, you know, wearing running shoes with a suit is kind of trendy. And, right. But, you know, it's, uh, it's neat to see the world catch up to the way I thought life should be lived. Yeah. Well, that little black stretchy pants that you've made has changed the way – People dress, uh, you know, the women dress, and it's amazing how you probably thought they were just going to be yoga pants, and now they wear them dress. They wear them dressy too, right? Well, I knew that from the surf skate snowboard business that you yeah. know, 
to make a product that can that's technical and looks good on the street. You know, it was kind of Italian uh, styling with West Coast function. I call it nice. So, yeah. Well, very good. Well, Chip, thank you so much for being on the circuit of success and uh, continued success to you. And we appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you very much, Brett. I have my brother is Brett and my son is Brett, by the way. Oh, perfect. Two T's. <laughs> yeah. I like it. All right.